Today we're going to continue on with our uh, series on Each One, Reach One, and uh, I've entitled it Spiritual Inception. I don't know if any of you saw the movie Inception, but that's uh, where I got the title, Spiritual Inception. But before we uh, get into the Word, I'd like us to just bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you for another day of life. We thank you for your perfect timing, that you do all things well. And we just pray right now, Lord, that you will minister through your spirit and through your word and touch each one of us just the way we need to be touched today uh, through your hand, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of an intelligent, young, two-career couple who decided that they wanted to really become well-established in their jobs and make a lot of money before they had any kids. So that's what they did. Um, they both became very successful. They were more than millionaires at the time when they had their first child, who was a little girl. They were nearly 30 years old at that time, and they were in a position to give her everything. So she was this very sharp, precocious little girl growing up. But the one problem that the parents had was that uh, they were so successful and so self-dependent that they didn't see much need for God or church or faith. So they really never went to church, except maybe once a year on Easter. Or they did at least believe that their infant should be baptized when they were born. So they had their first baby born, and, or baptized when she was born. And then when they had their second child five years later, they decided they'd go back to church again. The five-year-old hadn't even remembered going to church. So she was all excited because all the family was coming and they were sitting on the front row. And as the priest came up and uh, picked up her new baby sister, he uh, took her up to the front and he began speaking in Latin over her. And then he poured some water over the baby's head. At which point the five-year-old jumped up on the pew and she said, Mommy, Daddy, why is that old man in the funny robe brainwashing my baby sister? That's all she could figure out was going on there because she didn't have, I guess you need to take your kids to church if you don't want that to happen. But uh, anyway, uh, when we think of brainwashing, we usually don't equate it with baptism. Although a lot of churches do that. They baptism really represents coming into their doctrinal beliefs uh, and brainwashing them into those doctrinal beliefs rather than baptizing them into Jesus. But obviously that's not what healthy spirituality does. Uh, that's more what we associate with cults, usually. And when we talk about brainwashing, usually the first word that comes to people's mind is cults. And nowadays you have all kinds of people that are deprogrammers, they're professional uh, experts at getting people out of cults. And I don't know how many of you remember Patty Hearst. Probably most of you are old enough to remember that case pretty well. I was 21 years old at the time when she was kidnapped. But uh, this was a big deal because she was the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst. And everybody knew about the family. And, of course, the kidnappers were asking for a huge ransom. And they had uh, all these... Uh, agendas, they were terrorist type agendas going on, the Siamese Liberation Army. And what was so notable about this case was that they actually converted Patty Hearst to their way of thinking. Um, you know, this, we have a classic, uh, you know, expression for this in psychology today. It's called the Stockholm Syndrome, when uh, captors take a captive and then they convert the captive to their way of thinking. And that's what happened with uh, Patty Hearst. She actually got brainwashed into thinking these people were right. She started robbing banks with them. She got caught on camera. So she got tried and convicted. But she didn't serve very much time. Uh, people realized this was kind of an unusual case. And she only served 18 months. And then she was given a full pardon by President Clinton some years later. But uh, when we think about brainwashing, you know, it's easy to equate that with cults. But uh, sometimes people equate that with psychologists or psychiatrists. You know, they think uh, they're trained in, in brainwashing. I remember when I was a kid, uh, we were going to a church picnic. 
And uh, we happened to have a psychiatrist in the church who was going to be at this picnic. So as we were driving to the picnic, my dad was warning us all, don't be really careful what you say in front of this psychiatrist because he's going to analyze it and he's going to figure things out about our family. And, you know, he was really uh, concerned that this psychiatrist was going to read our minds and read our mail and all this kind of stuff. And I laugh at that now uh, as a psychologist because, uh, you know, that's so far-fetched in terms of how people think about these kinds of things. And they don't train us to brainwash people or read people's mail or any of that kind of stuff. But... Um, you know, when we, I watched the movie Inception this last week, which has a real bizarre kind of plot. It's all over the place, but a very complicated plot in many ways. But it's largely about stealing thoughts out of people's minds and then planting thoughts into people's minds against their will. And it reminded me of what the devil does. You know, the devil's all about Inception. He wants to plant thoughts in people's minds against their will so that they'll do his will. And God obviously never operates that way. Uh, God never is about imposing on us or uh, going against our will. Uh, but there is spiritual inception, and that really involves uh, having us voluntarily open our minds to the thoughts of God, having us voluntarily open ourselves to receiving a transformed mind and a renewed mind. And, and scripture talks about these kinds of things in various places. Uh, Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, the mind of Christ Jesus. That's what God wants for us, for our thoughts more and more to become his thoughts. And um, of course, Romans 12.2, um, the transformed mind, the renewed mind, this is the key to uh, walking in the spirit and being spirit-led is being tuned in to K-God, if you will. A and the best book that I've read on this is Bill Johnson's book, uh, The Supernatural Power of a Transformed Mind. I've recommended this before, but if you haven't read it yet, I really strongly recommend that you read this book because uh, it's one of the best books I've ever read. And... Um, it's all about this process of allowing our minds to be renewed through the Holy Spirit. But today we're really talking about witnessing, reaching out, touching others in the kingdom through a kingdom process. So I wanted to make three points regarding the mind of Christ, the way Jesus treated people, and the way Jesus reached out to people that I hope will uh, be relevant for us. Number one, Jesus invited people into a kingdom that was not about law and exclusion, but about grace and inclusion. Jesus invited people into a kingdom that was not about law and exclusion, but grace and inclusion. And, um, you know, so much of religion has to do with exclusion. So much of religion has to do with doctrine has to do with forms, formulas, creeds. I remember when I was in training uh, in my seminary work, you know, we were told our denomination has never had a creed, and that was technically true. Uh, that throughout the history, there's always been this resistance to a creed. But uh, it didn't take long to establish statements of beliefs and to believe that those beliefs should be binding on believers, and uh, that numbers up to 28 now. It used to be 27 when I was in seminary, but now it's 28. But, um, you know, when you look at this kind of thing, um, it's, it's interesting how you may not call it a creed, but so many people in the subculture refer to it as the truth. When I was growing up, uh, when did you come into the truth? How many years have you been in the truth? And uh, this, this expression has been around in the subculture for really more than a century, even in the early years, um, you know, the church came into this practice of equating its belief system with the truth and, and just not without any embarrassment at all. Uh, how long have you been in the truth? And so the truth was this collection of beliefs, uh, whereas Jesus says, the truth is me. 
Jesus says, I am the truth in John 14, 6. Uh, we're told in John 8, 32 and 36 the same thing. You shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. If therefore the Son has set you free, you'll be free indeed. The Son is the truth. Jesus is the truth. The truth is a person. Any religious attempt to say the truth is something else is a counterfeit. The truth is a person. And being in the truth is being in a relationship with that person. There is no counterfeit that can stand against that reality. Jesus is the truth. And I can still remember when I got baptized at the age of 13 that all the checks I had to check off, and several of them had to do with beliefs, several of them had to do with behaviors. You will not go to movies, you will never smoke, you will never drink, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, um, you know, basically uh, the church had never understood Colossians 2, 20 to 22. Uh, I love these verses where, where Paul says, uh, when you're in Christ, you must recognize that you've got out from under this system of rules and regulations and don't do this and don't do that. Uh, this is of the religious spirit. You must be out from under the system of the religious spirit when you're in the, in the truth of Christ, of being in him. And, and you must not fall again for this kind of thinking. And in verse 16 and 17 of that same chapter, he applies this to the Sabbath as well. Uh, he says, the Sabbath is, is a shadow of things to come. This is a symbol of the ultimate rest that we have in Christ. Um, it, it's not about do's and don'ts. And if we make it about do's and don'ts, we've missed the, the whole point. There is a blessing in the Sabbath that goes back to creation, as we've said many times, but we choose how much of that blessing to enter into. And it's never in the context of guilt or condemnation or don't do this, don't do that, making lists or rules. Uh, this is not the way of the kingdom, but it is the way of religion. And this isn't unique to any particular denomination. Uh, churches in general tend to be very much about making their doctrines and rules and regulations. And um, the Bible tells us that this will be the pattern of the last day church. This will be the rule of the last day church. When we look at 2 Timothy 3, 5, uh, it says, this last day church will have a form of godliness, but it will deny the power thereof. It'll be about forms and formulas and do's and don'ts and rules and regulations, but it will not walk in the power of God. And so, you know, when we look at the majority of professed religion around the globe today, you can see how true that is. The majority of religion, I believe, is functioning more under the religious spirit than it is under the power of the Holy Spirit. And God is working to change that, certainly. There have been some awesome revivals in the last century, but there's still an awful lot of form, formula. The word formula comes from form. They have a form of godliness, so they make formulas instead of having a living, powerful relationship with the living God. And of course, money. Um, those are the big things that um, churches tend to be focused on, numbers and money. You're always hearing about that. I remember when I was at the seminary, uh, they didn't allow us to baptize, even though we were considered to be ministers. And then the IRS made a ruling that uh, if, they, if you don't allow these uh, young people to baptize that you're calling ministers, it's going to cost you all this money. And immediately the theology changed. And, uh, and the theology suddenly was, oh yes, uh, the Lord has called you to baptize. And uh, he's called you to baptize certain numbers too. And we suddenly got quotas of how many baptisms we were expected to have, you know, on an annual basis. And um, it's very interesting how money impacts uh, theology sometimes. I was just reading about two churches in Kentucky some years ago, and they had a distillery, a whiskey distillery, right between them. And these two churches didn't get along all that well, but they began to like each other more as they had this common enemy 
because this distillery became very influential, um, had more and more influence in the city and beyond the city, and the churches really became concerned about that, so they called a joint prayer meeting, and they actually prayed against this distillery that was owned by atheists. And uh, believe it or not, the very night they had this joint prayer meeting, uh, the distillery was struck by lightning, caught on fire, and the whole place burned to the ground. And the churches were rejoicing that uh, their prayers had been answered. But the atheists weren't too happy. And especially they weren't happy when the insurance company said it was an act of God and they weren't going to cover it. <laughs> so uh, the distillery sued the two churches when it found out about this prayer meeting and um, sued them for conspiracy with God to destroy their business. <laughs> and it actually went to court. And um, the uh, Christians who were called into court said, our prayers had nothing to do with this. And uh, the atheist said, their prayers had everything to do with this. And, and the judge said, this is really interesting. Uh, the atheists who don't believe in God are saying prayers cause this, and the Christians who say they do believe in prayer saying their prayers had nothing to do with this. Uh, he said, I, I guess it's all about money, isn't it? Uh, that's what the judge concluded. But uh, religion often has to do with forms, formulas, creeds, crowds, and numbers, and finances. Those are the big things. And uh, Jesus was just the opposite. He wasn't about any of those things. He was about relationships that were grounded in God's grace. And uh, the only time Jesus ever really got very critical was when he was responding to the religious spirit, to the religious establishment. That's when he could get off pretty strongly with his words. But never in any other context do you see him attacking or really getting aggressive in any kind of negative way. In fact, it was just the opposite. Uh, Luke 7, 34, we've mentioned many times, he was known as the friend of sinners, the friend of publicans and prostitutes. Uh, the people of the world were generally attracted to him, even though the religious establishment had a hard time with him. And that's one reason I really enjoy working with gamblers, uh, working with severely depressed people, working with people that aren't uh, in the religious spirit domain. Uh, they're, they're really open. I, I, I think they're more open and willing to receive help than people that are in, under the religious spirit who think uh, they have it together. And Jesus said, you know, uh, those who recognize they're sick are the ones that you can help. The ones who don't think they need a physician, uh, you can't do much for them. But uh, when we're working with people who are desperate, who, who recognize they're lacking something in their lives, we have a great message for them. It was just one of the texts that was mentioned last week, 2 Timothy 1.9. Before the foundation of the world, God knew us. He called us. He had a destiny and plan for us. He loved us before we were even born or conceived. And to help people understand, if he loved you then, he certainly loves you now. No matter what you're struggling with, no matter where you're at, God desperately loves you. He has a destiny. Uh, he's calling you to that destiny. And, uh, you know, again, I think the most effective way we witness many times is by asking questions. I really believe in the Socratic method. Uh, you know, asking the right questions. We were just talking about that in the Sabbath school this morning. How do we ask the right questions that will get people to think differently about God, especially a false view of God that they've been raised with in so many cases? And, um, you know, I, I think this is just a part of our everyday lifestyles for kingdom people. Uh, evangelism is a kingdom lifestyle for kingdom Christians. It's not something you go and do. It's not an activity. Uh, well, let's go be missionaries or let's go, uh, go out and witness right now. Or, you know, this kind of dichotomy between the secular and the sacred, that breaks down in the kingdom. In the kingdom, all things are holy in, in the sense that no matter what we're doing, no matter where we're working, no matter what people we're hanging out with, 
we bring the kingdom there. And uh, many times we do that by asking the right kinds of questions. And uh, life's a joy. I was just mentioning this morning how fun it was to uh, attend Crowder School up there because the, the people that were there, and they weren't all young people, the majority of them were young people, but they were just so filled with joy. And, and you could just see a joy exuding from their lives. And, and so often when people are under the religious spirit, life's a drain, it's a pain, uh, you have to go to church just to get recharged, just to survive another week, or you have to go to some spiritual retreat to get refreshed because life's such a drag. Um, it's the opposite of that in the kingdom. We're, we're flowing in the joy of the Lord. We're flowing in the energy of the Holy Spirit. That's something that's with us 24-7. It's not something that, uh, oh, life's sure a pain. I can hardly wait to get recharged somewhere. Um, that, that's, that's more the religious spirit reality. And I was just sharing this morning, uh, one of the speakers we had up there was Jeff Turner, who's written the book, Saints in the Hands of a Happy God. And it's uh, in contrast to Jonathan Edwards' famous book, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And uh, for far too long, Christianity has functioned under the sinners in the hands of an angry God. And evangelism has been, oh, we got to save you from hell. You know, please say these four spiritual laws so you won't go to hell. And it's all about fear and trying to save people from hell. Uh, and that's not what the kingdom's about. The kingdom's about uh, you've already been covered by the perfect finished work of the Son. Uh, you are in his kingdom. It's just waking up to who we are, what our identity is, and, uh, and then entering into the joy of that. Um, point number two, Jesus' kingdom was not about numbers or building mega churches, but about relationships, commitment, and community. His kingdom was not about numbers and mega churches, but about relationships, commitment, and community. I find it very interesting that uh, Jesus was not just ambivalent about forming a mega church, but he was absolutely 100% resistant to doing so. And, and most of you know the story in John 6 where he feeds the 5,000. And that was just 5,000 men. Um, by all accounts, there were women and children there too. So it was probably more like 12,000 people that were fed that day miraculously. And uh, that qualifies as a mega church by just about anyone's count. And we're told that after they were fed, the disciples and Jesus went across the lake. And this group followed them all the way around. They walked all the way around the lake because they were so taken by what God had done there. This wasn't some naturalistic thing where someone saw someone share their food, so everybody shared their food, like the liberals uh, like to say. This was clearly a miracle. These people knew it was a miracle, and they wanted more. So they follow him around the lake all this distance. And uh, what, what do you want us to do, Master? We'll do whatever you want. Uh, we'll follow you wherever you go. Uh, I want you to drink my blood and eat my flesh. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> it's just so, so completely the worst possible thing you can say in evangelism class, you know. Uh, when the teacher's teaching you these great evangelistic methods, uh, this is how you win the masses. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And what does it say in John 6:66? 6, it says, from that day many of his disciples never walked with him again. <laughs> they didn't want anything to do with this guy. Uh, really, just the 12 are left. And Jesus turns to them and says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter says, oh, where do we have to go? I mean, come on, we've seen too much. But, uh, you know, th but they were pretty disillusioned. Here's their big chance for a mega church, And Jesus just shoots it all down. And uh, it's funny, whenever I get introduced as a pastor to someone or someone finds out I'm a pastor, almost always the very first question is, how big is your church? You know, uh, that's the American thing. How big is your church? You know, how, how many people and how much money do you guys have? That, we we want to know how seriously to take you. Um, you know, and that's what the religious spirit is consumed with. That's what the American mindset 
uh, of success is consumed with to a great degree. And, you know, I'm not here to put down mega churches. I, I think God certainly uses them. I think he largely uses them as halfway houses uh, where people are introduced to God in some way, shape, or form, and God's calling them to more than that. That's what Bill Hybel says, who's the pastor of the Willow Creek mega church. He says, our only real purpose is to introduce people and get them into a community where they can get more involved and be more committed than our kind of introductory brand of Christianity offers. And I think that's very neat that he uh, has come out publicly and stated that. But when you look at the research, um, there is an interesting profile about megachurches that I find quite fascinating. Five aspects of megachurches uh, that people really identify with. And one is identifying with a famous preacher. People love to identify with a best-selling author who's their preacher, and they can all point to that. Hey, he's my preacher, you know, and identify with that. Uh, number two, convenience without commitment. You have all the stuff you can get from the church, and you don't have to commit to anything, which is tied to the third thing, anonymity. It's very easy to attend a mega church and be completely anonymous. No one knows who you are. No one cares. Um, you know, you can just cruise through and get what you want and leave. Um, the prestige of belonging to a big-name church, uh, Willow Creek, Saddleback, these kinds of churches have a great prestige to them. So people get a, a benefit from being part of that prestige. And the fifth one is romance. Uh, people don't realize how many young people, and especially single young people, go to these mega churches because they're perceived as a meat market, you know, a great place to uh, meet other young people and all the whole dating scene and all that kind of stuff that goes on. But um, my own experience when I, I, I've been involved, of course, with mega churches, I was on the staff of a mega church for 20 years, so I got a good taste of that. But, um, you know, the three things that I would say one, when I started going to the Vineyard, which was certainly a mega church, um, I didn't go there to establish new relationships. I was going there to get a new world view of how the kingdom operated. So I wasn't going out of my way to make a bunch of new relationships because I already had a ton in my work as a university chaplain and, and uh, pastor. But, um, but no one, I, I went there for years and years and years, and no one ever tried to contact me or invite me anywhere. Or, I mean, it was pretty interesting that how easy it is to just be anonymous in a mega church, how impersonal uh, that tends to be. Um, secondly, when I uh, have had kind of a leadership role in the ministerial association here, I, I went around to a bunch of the mega churches in the area, and I, in, I invited them, uh, met with the pastors, said, can you spare at least one pastor to come and meet with us once a week? And these were churches that had from eight pastors up to 20 pastors. Oh, yeah, in every case I was assured, absolutely, we will. We've never had one pastor from one of those churches ever show up, uh, which is pretty amazing to me. I, I think mega churches tend to be quite self-dependent. We have everything we need. We don't need anything from any of these other churches. Um, so that self-dependence, you know, can be a problem as well. And then, of course, there's politics. Um, the bigger the church, the more politics you're going to have. And it doesn't mean that small churches can't have politics. I've seen some really nasty politics in small churches. And we had some nasty politics we had to deal with before the move. But um, I've been really thrilled and pleased with the lack of politics in this place. Uh, it's really been a kingdom family as far as I'm concerned, and I've really enjoyed uh, the kingdom family that we are. And, uh, you know, I, I think part of it is because we're not about numbers and we're not about money. We're not up here begging for money. Uh, I love the uh, appeal Gary makes. Do what the Spirit moves you to do. And, and what's been amazing to me these last 10 weeks is we've had the best 10 weeks of giving we've ever had. We haven't been under 2,000 one week. It's been up 5,000 or more, or uh, always above 2,000. That's never happened uh, 10 weeks in a row. 
for us. And uh, it's not because we're beating anybody with guilt or begging for money or any of that, you know. And, and especially during summer months, this is kind of unheard of. But, uh, you know, I think the Spirit just moves people and there's a spirit of generosity and it, it's an awesome blessing to see. But, um, you know, having a family is awesome. And I love the small groups. I hope all of you have a spiritual partner and are in a small group because those things are so important to uh, be family to each other. But most of us know each other by name and that, that's just a neat uh, kind of experience as far as I'm concerned. One of the speakers we had at, up at Crowder School was uh, Tony Sai, and he's written a book called Outrageous Love. And I forgot to put that on the reading list for you, Teresa, so you might want to add that one. But it's a great little book, Outrageous Love. And, and he lives outrageous love. It was just neat to see how he exuded God's love and how the whole little community there he was one of the host pastors that was there every day. And uh, I really think his love was contagious for the whole group. But, um, you know, he was making fun of churches that are preoccupied with numbers. A and there is so much of that in our culture today. Uh, and, and besides that, the Bible does not speak well of that. God is not pleased with people that are preoccupied with numbers. We know that from the story over in 2 Samuel 24.1. And the funny thing about this, it says God moved David to go number Israel. We know that's not the case because uh, God comes against him and says, why did you do this? Uh, you're, you're, I'm giving you three choices for punishment. This is pretty interesting. Uh, okay, you've got three choices for punishment, David. You can have seven years of famine. That's number one. Number two, you can have three years fleeing from your enemies. Or number three, you can have three days of plague. Which do you think he chose? If, if you know your Bible, you know he chose the plague. He was kind of like me. Uh, when I was little, my dad used to say, okay, you've done it. These are your choices. Two weeks grounded, a week of losing your allowance, or a hard spanking right now. And I always chose the hard spanking right then to get it over with, even though it wasn't too fun. But, uh, you know, that's what David did. He chose the short one. But 70,000 people died in that three-day plague, all because he numbered Israel. That's pretty interesting. God's really against this preoccupation with numbers, and look how big we are, and look how great we are, and look how wonderful we are, because we have all these numbers. God doesn't like that stuff. It's interesting in First in First Chronicles 21:1 when it tells the same story. This time they get it right. They say Satan is the one who provoked David to go number Israel, not God. God doesn't tell David to do something and then punish him for it. Uh, the devil's the one that got him into this thing of pride, and David knew it was wrong. He knew he shouldn't have done it um, because. The kingdom of God is not about numbers, it's not about money, it's not about our success, it's about him. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Everything is about God's spirit. And uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7 makes it clear that as human beings, we tend to be preoccupied with outward appearance. What looks good on the outside, what looks like success on the outside, God says, no, forget that stuff. It's all about the heart. That's all I care about is the heart. I care about people who are, have a heart for me and are willing to be spirit-led. And many times, the smaller, the better, you know, like we see in Gideon and other stories in the Bible. Many times, it's the smaller, the better. But the third uh, point I want to make this morning, Jesus rejects the spirit of proselytization and embraces the spirit of being hidden in God. Jesus rejects the spirit of proselytization and embraces the spirit of being hidden in God. What do I mean by that? Well, first, Matthew 23, 15, Jesus makes it clear that he's not about proselytization and this aggressive evangelism that's about numbers. That's what the Pharisees were about. Jesus says, you cross land and sea, to win one convert, one proselyte. Uh, you'll do anything to increase your numbers, look good on 
your belt. But uh, then you make them twice as fit for hell as they were in the first place. A religion that is motivated by numbers and the religious spirit and human success uh, makes people twice as fit for hell as they were in the first place. The religious spirit actually does more harm than good because it's a demonic spirit. And it's a very subtle demonic spirit that people don't understand is a demonic spirit. So they're pulled into something that they think is good that's actually bad. And that's why Jesus says, makes you twice as fit for hell as you were in the first place. And, um, you know, even when we had Rodney Howard Brown's group come and, and went out and did a lot of witnessing, and a lot of that was good for me, you know. I, it's not my personality to go out and make all these contacts that we did. And, and it, it grew me, and I had some neat experiences doing that. But I also had some real cognitive dissonance when they'd come back every night and throw out all the numbers and uh, this how many contacts and how many converts and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, it was <laughs> a very uncomfortable kind of thing to, to be in a situation where you're counting like everything that everybody did and look at how wonderful this is. Um, you know, I think it was 23,000 uh, people that accepted Christ during those two weeks in the presence and stuff. But, um, you know, it was interesting. Um, but, again, I, I don't know that people often get help that much by this kind of evangelism. You know, obviously God can use anything, and, and Jesus did send his disciples out two by two. So, you know, there certainly is a place for that kind of thing. But um, I, I think a lot of people just kind of want to shut their shutters when they see the two by twos coming up to their door. Uh, reminds me of the story of the lady who'd been a member of a particular church that goes out two by two, and she saw these two people coming up to her doorstep, and she didn't want anything to do with them, but they just kept knocking and knocking and knocking till it finally drove her crazy, and she opened the door. She said, I know who you are, and I don't want anything to do with you. And she slammed the door, and the door came bouncing back, and she thought one of them had stuck their foot in the door, so she grabbed it again and slammed it. Didn't you hear me? It came bouncing back again. And the poor witness said, uh, Ma'am, I think you ought to take your unconscious cat out of that doorway before you slam that door again. You know, <laughs> the cat got caught running into the house. But uh, anyway, um, witnessing that's very... Uh, high profile, it's an activity, it's something we keep track of, something we report to people. All this kind of goes against what Jesus stood for. When you look at what he says in Matthew 6, 1 to 4, don't let your deeds be done before men. Don't keep track of stuff. Don't try to take credit for kingdom stuff. Don't try to make money off kingdom stuff. You know, all these... Uh, not of this world, and what would Jesus do, and these things that make all this money for people. I, I don't know that that's really what Jesus was about. Um, he was about being subtle, being quiet, um, being secret agents for the kingdom. Um, he was a kingdom subversive, if you will. Don't let your deeds be known before man. Uh, you'll get your rewards in heaven. I've, I've got a friend that I dearly love. He, 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 when I... Uh, the Lord, and, uh, I went through an experience once where he uh, came, and this was shortly after I'd been baptized with the Spirit, and the Lord called him to come to my house. Uh, I was teaching, and he said, can I just meet you at noon? So uh, I said, sure. I, I lived right close to the school. and So he comes over to my house at noon. The Lord's called me to anoint you. Okay, okay, that's cool. Um, so he gets out this gigantic bottle of oil and pours the entire thing over my head. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> my, my hair was just like totally screwed for days all the all the students were making fun of me but uh, it was <laughs> I had to change my clothes and try to get back to my next class on time it was pretty funny but but this guy is just totally a secret agent for the kingdom uh, he anytime I wanted to give him recognition or something he'd never allow it no you're, you're stealing my reward 
you're stealing my reward in heaven. Uh, so he was all about his reward in heaven and wanted nothing to do with any earthly recognition or any recognition of what he did. So I won't even tell you his name because <laughs> he'd probably be mad at me for sharing that story if I did. But um, in John 18, uh, 38, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, Jesus was about building a faceless kingdom, not about numbers, not about being on the news, not about high profile stuff. It was a faceless, underground, subversive kingdom that had a lot to do with just asking the right questions and turning people's lives around through the power of the Spirit in very subtle and, and secretive ways in many cases. And uh, I got a couple books uh, this week from Mervyn. One was The Midas Touch, which is one of the better books I've ever read on money. Uh, about from a Christian perspective, especially from a charismatic Christian perspective. It's called the Midas Touch, and it's a balanced approach to biblical prosperity. There's so much craziness out there, and, and he deals with all the craziness that you hear about money and says, no, this isn't me, and this isn't what the Bible teaches. But thank you, I got through it, and I enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, he recommended a second book that I hadn't heard of or read, and it was by uh, Bill Hammond, and I got it on my Kindle. And uh, this is all about a, a kingdom of faceless Christians that God is building up. It's called The Day of the Saints. And I've been really enjoying that book, too, because uh, I really believe that that's what God is doing. He's not like raising up the spiritual superstars so much anymore. He, he's preparing his whole body to walk in the John 14:12 reality of the greater things that we will do as he pours his spirit out on all flesh. And uh, that, it was a great book. I'm not through it all yet, but I'm really enjoying it. And uh, it, it reminded me some of, um, at least one chapter reminded me of the seven mountain prophecy that we've talked about, how God's empowering. And I, I've recommended this book to you before, Johnny Enlow's book, uh, again, I really recommend you check it out if you haven't. But uh, God really is raising up a kingdom that people aren't recognizing that much. They don't really see what's happening, but I think it's going to be there and going to be mature and riping right as he pours his spirit out on all flesh. And it's going to dramatically uh, change the world as we know it. And, uh, you know, in Luke 17, 21, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is in you. That can also be translated in your midst, which I think is the primary translation because Jesus was saying, I am the kingdom of God. Wherever the will of God is, is, the kingdom is. And Jesus always perfectly did his will, so he was the personification of the kingdom of God. But he's saying, you too have the kingdom of God in you, to the degree that you will walk in God's will, to the degree that you'll do what the Spirit is calling you to do. And, um, you know, sometimes we run into these Christians that are super aggressive and, come on, we need to take it by force. There's all these Christian books out there that talk about taking the kingdom by force. And they're quoting Matthew 11:12, where Jesus talks about the violent take it by force. And they're saying that's a good thing. You know, they're, they're, they're arguing that this is what we need to be as these super aggressive Christians that just have so much faith, name it and claim it, that we take the world by force. But that's not what, what he's saying in that verse. Uh, he's saying the kingdom of God suffers violence because of this. It, it's not a good thing when people take it by force. Taking it by force is running ahead of God. It, it's presumption. It's not being spirit-led. It's thinking you know what God wants when it's really what you want or what you think God wants and you haven't been shown by the Spirit. If Jesus needed to be shown by the Spirit, how much more do we? In John 5, 19, he says, I don't do anything unless God shows me to do it. I don't do anything. That's pretty amazing. If God, if Jesus himself functioned that way, how much more does he want us to make sure that we're listening to the Spirit and, and being led by the Spirit rather than just jumping boldly in and doing all kinds of crazy things because we don't want the kingdom to suffer violence because of our presumption. 
Which leads me to my last verse today, which is Colossians 3.3. 3. I love this verse about being hidden in Christ. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. This is my son's favorite verse. And he really lives this. You know, uh, I, 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 I envy him how he lives a life hidden in Christ and bringing the kingdom in to his everyday life in the psych ward, wherever he's working, whatever he's doing. He's not about being high profile. He's not about people knowing who he is. Uh, he's, he's totally committed to being hidden in Christ, and I'm sure he wouldn't want me telling you this, but, uh, uh, you know, I, this is what the Bible calls us to be, is hidden in Christ, to be listening to the Spirit, to be suddenly, subtly, you know, witnessing through the right questions, really trying to empower people in terms of helping them understand who they are uh, in terms of how God sees them, how much he loves them, the destiny he has on them, and, and having them discover this for themselves it, rather than being indebted to you or having to join your church or, or this kind of thing. God wants us to just take the kingdom with us wherever we go and know that seeds are planted and those seeds are going to do wonderful things regardless of whether we ever see any of the results of that in this life or not. Uh, being hidden with Christ is something that God calls us to. And I, I think it's very much tied to this notion of having the mind of Christ, uh, being in Christ, having a renewed mind, experiencing spiritual inception.